boys and girls, how lucky are we today on Tough Cookies to be talking to my good pal, a pioneer of 60s rock and roll, a pioneer of 70s country rock and singer-songwriter records, a pioneer of music video in the 1980s and film production. You know him from the Monkees, you know him from First National Band, but you know him as the great Nez. Mike Nesmith, how you doing today, my pal? I'm doing very well after that intro. I mean, I had no idea I was that cool. <laughs> Are you impressed with yourself? <laughs> I'm impressed with that intro. <laughs> Last time somebody said that about me, I was at a department store about to do a runway walk. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you right now, Nez? Isn't that a great question? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm in my office and uh, we've set it up kind of as a production suite. And then, but, and I've got a couple of studios not too far from here. We're building a nice streaming studios there. So then who knows what will happen? I mean, that's, you know, everybody's going to be online yelling at each other or yelling. Or I don't know. I don't know what this is. All this bad feeling that's going around. And it seems to me like we... We all took a collective hit. It wasn't like some bad guy went in there and went, you, 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 you. It's like, boom, and wiped us all out. Did me anyway. I mean, I, I, I keep, you know, every time I start to do some, something, somebody in my coterie will say, you can't do that as a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I feel like this is one of the reasons that I, you know, I've had so much joy listening to your music over the last few days, getting ready for this, uh -huh. because it gets, it just puts me back, you know, the, the music of the Monkees and the music of the First National Band, which I'm a massive fan. Uh -huh. It just takes me back to, you know, not that I was born, but to a, a, a more innocent time. Yeah, you know, a different time in the music business. Well, that was one of the things I made an effort to. Uh, include in the music was this innocence uh, because uh, for the most part you know boy girl songs are uh, they get coarse or they get uh, you know gushy and <clears throat> it's a uh, I, I like the innocence of the great writers who are simple and just say the point and do the way they did now I'm not I'm not a great writer I'm very far from it but you know you you can kind of learn well don't do that do this and it will it will go better for you and that's that's the way i thought it thought about these uh, these albums uh, make sure that that the meaning is clear and then get out of the way of it well speaking of speaking of great records you put out this little record and this is the reason i wanted to talk to you because i want people to pay attention to the record, Nick Partners record, uh, which it was really a bootleg. I guess you would call it a bootleg. Um, yeah. A lot of my listeners and a lot of my viewers on Tough Cookies are really big Monkees fans. And in fact, we took a poll of which bands, uh, which artists they would like me to interview and the Monkees were in the top three. So this is, this is gonna be real big for a lot of our viewers. But some of them aren't familiar with this Cosmic Partners part of your career. And so I'm wondering, because I think it's a very interesting record, it's very soulful, could you give us a little background on how that tape was recorded and was it lost? How, where did it come from? Well, you're, you keep saying that tape, but you know it's a whole album. Um, right. And <clears throat> so I don't know which particular tape you're, you're referring to, but... I can tell you that the uh, genesis of the first national band records really came out of Red Rhodes voicing on his pedal steel guitar. And uh, then there's a lot of jokes associated with playing pedal steel, especially especially among the players. They, you know, say it, as long as the bar is moving, it's not out of tune. And <clears throat> there are uh, ways of playing it that create more of this, I'm going to use a big word here, but more of this mellifluous sound that the right. instrument has natural to it, which is like flowing water. And somebody who can really do that, Red Good, 
can make your skin beat up or whatever it is we, we do we get goosebumps <laughs> so when we were playing he kept stumbling he would come to the solos and i said make it less bluesy make it more swing maybe and he was like you know i just i just played this between the chords and so i watched him for a minute and it just occurred to me is there a fuzzy over there it was there was one in here but he, um i'll go get you one yeah give me a minute you know I'm, I'm, I'm about to use it as a prop okay. please do <laughs> Make uh, yourself at home, because you are at home. Because <laughs> that's where I am. Right. Um, and I said, Red, you know, and I was tentative because I didn't know him that well. And you never want to cross a line with somebody that, you know, makes you put them up. And you just, you just don't. So I was, I was tiptoeing in. And I said, well, Red, have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about trying this? For our home, for our viewers that don't know what this is, can you explain to the kids what this is? Well, that's a that's called a pre-roll. This is the commercial marijuana product that you get if you go into a dispensary. Yeah, and it's a. You can see what size it is. It's not very big. It's about one joint. My 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 big finger. Mm -hmm. um, there are different measurements in terms of the active chemical, which is tetrahydrocannabinol. We don't want to get too far into this. And <clears throat> it's, it's- Maybe we uh, do. Maybe we do. Okay. Well, anyway, so Red took a couple of hits and began to play. And we came to the solo section of Thanks for the Ride, or the outro section. I don't know what it was. I can't remember right now. It's just, you know, it lives in my mind. <laughs> like the shimmering city on a hill so <laughs> it it what happened was this these swirls and starts and things big shadow on the wall there oh, okay it's dramatic to... no it's good it's good it was good he liked it so, uh, these patterns and things started coming out of a music that i'd never heard before i now know that it exists in that pat in that instrument if you can find somebody that can play it. Yeah. Like it, you got to use both hands, all 10 fingers, both knees, both elbows. I mean, you, you, there is no external boogie. Everything goes into the instrument. Right. When it comes, it, when it comes out, it comes out in these convolutions and waves that's so different than what's going in. I, I don't know how to describe it better than that. I would go to the PAL, PAL, you know, to watch Red and the house band play. And Red had this exquisite touch with his feet, his toes, and his heels on the pedals and his knees as they moved in and out of those pedals. It was, it was, um, it was like watching a dance to watch his feet, mm. uh, but not a Fred Astaire dance. These ex exquisitely precise moves that would move the tone of a of one note up so many centimes. I mean, it, it was just so subtle. But when it was embedded in these massive 20 note chords of the pedal steel guitar, assuming you played one, it, it, it was like the heavens had opened. Mm. Celestial music, and it came out of what you think of is nowhere. <laughs> it comes out, but but it's coming out of this. It's coming out of the enhanced altered state. I mean, I, I figured that out after a while and said, well, that's okay, I can do that. Let's go play a, we'll get a little high before we play. And I said, yeah, that'll be, that'll be simple enough if we, if, we, if we do it and everybody else enjoys it, we'll just, we'll leave, we'll leave it at that because it's a, it's a beautiful sound. It makes things really different. Now, Nez, were the recordings of that McCabe's performance did did you have them or where were they in all these years? You know, how were they found? Uh, answers, I don't know. Um, I think one of my minions uh, got in touch with people there at McCabe's and they traced them down 
and they said they found them in a cash register down in, under a cash register or in some storage facility. Now, I don't know how true any of that is. I think I may have just gotten it third or fourth or fifth hand. So I don't know. I really don't know. I know it's that such it's a up. fabulous recording and it captures a unique moment in time, yeah. not just in, in your career, but really in Los Angeles, California music history. Uh, I'm wondering, it's an odd question that I'd like to ask you about it, but what, how, what genre of music did you think you were playing? Did you think you were playing country, country rock, rock and roll, singer, songwriter, folk? What would you call it? Well, I, I, I couldn't. I kept falling off of that trail. And I, it, 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 it took Katie around the side of the mountain and so slowly run out so you didn't have any place to put your feet. So you just had to back out. And what that would basically mean is, you know, if you come to the bridge, play it to, like it was played on the record. So if you're doing I Fall to Pieces, play the I Fall to Pieces bridge like, like they played it on the record. But otherwise, take off, follow red, hit your wagon to a star, all that kind of thing. Now, considering you were the, the Texas guy in the Monkees. Uh, let, let me give you a data set. A man named Gary Strobel, S T R O B L, who's mm -hmm. kind of an unofficial historian of the Henry Diltz archives and library. Mm -hmm. Henry's still alive, but, but Gary has worked for him for 40 years and, and has knows where all this stuff is. And so we share a common bond. And what Gary has his eyes open for things that may be significant to me or people who are doing research. And uh, he found them uh, at McCabe's by talking to the man there who recorded it. Okay. Right. And if you need Gary's name, uh, I mean, he's a wealth of information. If you guys are, you guys are doing text, you really got to get him on your Rolodex. But uh, he, he's a, uh, a wealth of information you really need to get into. so the song on there joanne which was really a hit uh when you made the record magnetic south and you recorded joanne did you think that was the single did you think that was going to be a hit did you think it would be a radio song well no by that time uh there was no unmarked part of my body my emotional aesthetic physical body none none I was an absolute wreck. And it was, um, you know, the, the grass helped a little as it does, but only a little as it does. And the, um, the camaraderie and the people I was hanging with and the sort of high life, all of that was okay, but no, none of it had this sub sub the aesthetic of uh, the great, beautiful poetries. And I wanted that so much. And when Red started to play these, how about this? And it became magical. I realized that's how you do this. And that's one of the reasons that these ancient instruments that make those weird noises, do it because that they had to put that in somehow and didn't know how to do it. So finding that with, with red became a, uh, it was just an article of faith when we started playing. We were gonna play to that space in each other's uh, uh, sonic heart. I don't know what the right words are, but you know what I mean. Yeah, Nez, listen, in the last three minutes, this weird sunlight beam is going right into the camera and it oh. makes you- Thank you for getting that. I was just about to interrupt, but you guys are on such a good roll. <laughs> I mean, it makes you look very angelic, celestial, but we're going to, we just want to tilt the camera a hair. We can... There you go. Wait, is that better, George? We can oh. move him. Just a little bit if you can, yeah. Um, a, little, a little farther down? Oh, we can move you to that wall. It'll take me like two minutes. Would that be okay if we move? I'm sorry, we don't normally film at this time of day. It's okay. I just want, you know, he's so handsome. I want him to look, I want everybody to see. Yeah. 
you want to, if you want to try sliding it a little bit closer to to the net, yeah. it work too. Um, yeah. Oh, it, oh it, there you go. Because oh, the sun's probably going to continue to. Oh so yeah. Good. We can try. We can try this for a Ooh. little bit. Uh, Nasa. Look right on the right on the edge there. Yeah. You can kind of do it like this. There, there you go. go. You're going to be transcribing a lot of this anyway, right? Yeah. I have a stenographer right now. Every word. This this uh, gangster shirt works really good. It, I got it at uh, at uh, Folsom when I was doing Seven to Life for uh, parking room. There you go. So Nez, I want to you know I I'm a, I was a little too young to get the monkeys on the first go round, but I'm of that generation that grew up watching the show as a kid in the '80s, and we thought the monkeys were cool. Uh, I mean, really, like because they are, they were. Well, I, and and I know exactly what you're saying. A lot of people say that I had this conversation a lot, <laughs> and uh, it works really good if you've got some fine gin and some fine uh, tonic, and you can sit there and while away in the afternoon. But since we don't, and you and I can't share a joint, buddy, buddy. Um, <clears throat> I, I, Frame the question up for me again. Tell me yeah, what, well, what I, I grew up with, with Monkeys Round 2, which was in the cool. 80s. Yeah, I and I just thought the show, we, yeah. we just thought it was funny. Like, we used to watch Happy Days reruns. We used to watch Monkeys reruns. Yeah, yeah. And we thought, of, we thought of you as a television, a comedy television star, as much as, you know, a yeah. musician. Ah. And I want you to know, before, before I go further, that this show that you're on right now, similarly, is a comedic variety show. Okay, good. And we, <laughs> we do song performances and comedy, and we talk about issues, and, but, it, but it is, it is a, you know, a variety show. And I just wanted to let you know how much I love the monkeys as a kid, and I feel like it was influential on my warped sense of humor. Well, it, 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 you were right, and everybody who missed it uh, were not right. It wasn't that they were wrong, they just missed it. And <clears throat> the, the underlying truth to the monkeys is that they were not real. Right. That was, it was a complete fabrication of the arts. The writing, filming, acting, uh, staging, all of the stuff that went into creating the film that became the little miniature movie that was the monkeys and all the editing and stuff that went into it. It was all done consciously to put the monkeys into what was almost like um, paper doll mode, mode, that people could more or less do anything they wanted to with it. Now that wasn't real. Anytime you saw something like that, that was real, it was hopelessly tacky. Take the plastic strip and put it across the television set and over to the couch, but don't let mama you see it. And if you've got a Pomeranian, oh, well, never mind. That kind of stuff had died in the age of kangaroo, Captain Kangaroo and right. Fred Rogers and so forth. Now, let me just quickly say here, I thought of these guys as creative and aesthetic giants, especially Fred Rogers. But what's his name, Kangaroo? You know, he, he had his chops. I mean, these shows were meticulously crafted for the three-year-old mind. Monkeys, not so much. But and here's a little magic trick. And remember it. Nobody knew what it was for. Nobody said, I know. It's for the 14-and-a-half-year-old prepubescent white female that lives in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Not a word, not a word. And because none of those discouraging words were there, it was left to just roll pell-mell. And <clears throat> it started to do that until people started sounding off like, like the editor and said, so fuck am I gonna do with this? None of it matches, it doesn't fit together. I can't make a show out of this, this is it. And um, Ravelson, and uh, the, the director of the time, whoever would have to do it, say, don't worry about it. 
just stick it together, stick it together, and it'll work. Trust us. And sure enough, that's the monkey that you and I, monkeys that you and I and everybody see. It's a, it's a pastiche. And it just pops itself together and pops itself apart, but with no more specificity than pop beads. You know, pop, you know, I mean, and that's, that is what made it magical because you're constantly creating the monkeys as you watch them. Now, you can get real heavy into that. You can, I don't know, there's probably some communications theory that comes into play there. None of which interests me, by the way. Well, all of which only slightly interest me. But for, for the most part, the thing that I carried with me was that was a completely fictitious trip. Mm -hmm. That was a totally made of, it was high, high art. But it's not high art like Ed Rouché or one of our great artists. It was high art like, um, Ah, I need a well, it's like it's like Warhol. It's pop art, really. Excellent. I will take it. I will stipulate to it. You are right, Andy. Andy, not that I knew him. Was that was that our party for Head? The, wow, uh, the movie. Yeah, he was there, blonde wig and all, and and um, it was at that party that he said to me, and this is what he said. He said, "Well, everybody's famous for fifteen minutes." And it lodged in my head because it had it was unpublished at that point. And I thought, listen, the master has just spoken. <laughs> Make note. <laughs> so I did. And I'm now telling it to you, faithful, a faithful dog that I am. <laughs> Speaking of head, uh, what do you remember about a young Jack Nicholson? Like, what's the first time you crossed paths? Well, I met Jack on the set and fell madly in love with him. Uh, you know, in terms of um, bromances and man bros and with whatever the lingo is, Jack was my guy. I thought he was the coolest guy in the world. And to some degree, I still do. We're all a little older. We're all a little more slower of speech and a little drunker than we should be. And so we don't have that spark of our 20s. But believe me, Jack lit up every room he went into. So what, what did I do? Well, I did what Ralph Waldo Emerson told me to do. I hitched my wagon to his star. And I began to kind of imitate him and hang out next to him when he was chatting up women and all that stuff until he, he decided that uh, I had fallen out of favor. My wife at the time was way off the, off the dial. And mm -hmm. so you know, he said, please don't come over again unless you call me. All this is in a book, which uh, you can read anytime you like. But uh, so, what's the, what's the name of the book for my for my fans? You know, watching. Uh, I think it's Infinite Tuesday. Infinite Tuesday. Uh, Infinite Tuesday. It's a it's a rip. Only my my book is a, is less than hundred pages long. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's it's sufficiently long what have we got oh we got a that's that's futuristic yeah that's really cool oh wait that's not working okay sorry i was trying to block potential sun rays with post it <laughs> we're good we're good flags from the good. <laughs> he looks good don't worry we'll let you know yeah. if it starts to we're all right now there's enough video info here he can cast shadows and stew stuff with it so leave it alone for right now Nez. Uh, my good friend Jerry was on one episode of The Monkeys with you. He's a good friend of mine here in Philadelphia, Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter with the Heater, and he played a DJ on one of the episodes. I'm, I've had him on the show here. I'm just wondering if you remember having him on the show. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a constant and kind of cra crass line of demarcation about people that we didn't know came came on the show. Straight or gay? You know, I'll punt that till after the call. <laughs> Got it. No, I no, that's 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 a common answer. Punt. Um, and and it was uh, there was a um, circles like tend to happen in gay nightclubs mm -hmm. like this that would happen around the set, and it was certain people 
commanded certain circles. And uh, I don't remember your friend outside of one of those circles. If you told me whether it's straight or gray, I might be able to pick it out back. You know, it all it's all just a big blur. I'm going to ask it's, you about another obscure figure. I was looking at the back cover of Magnetic South last night. Yeah. And I saw the name Felton Jarvis on there. Felton, Felton. Yeah. And uh, some of my viewers have heard me talk about him because I do a lot of Elvis on the show. And you, you know, play the Elvis songs. Yeah, yeah, play the Elvis music. Yeah, yeah. So he's best known for his work with Elvis, but did he help produce the record or did he run the label? What was your connection with Felton Jarvis? Well, it, it's a long and not terribly interesting story. Um, I have been trying to get a record deal somewhere outside the monkeys and nobody wanted me or the music because I was playing first national band and <clears throat> the guy who was in charge of the monkeys for RCA was a man named Harry Jenkins. Right. I think he's passed, but he was a, he was a King Hill guy. And those guys who ran that company from Chet Atkins to Harry Jenkins, to Felton Jarvis, were just country gentlemen. They were kind of easy going. And when they got crazy, they got crazy like, uh, um, you know, a Japanese drunken party. It, it, was, it was crazy beyond anything you would imagine somebody would do, especially them. All of them may have been back in heat for what I know, except right. J Harry Jenkins said, look, just, play what you can play. And I said, well, I, uh, okay, I will. Now, I'll send you the four songs I have. And he said, yeah, they're good. Let's go make that. So I said to Felton, I said, Felton, I need it. I don't have a band. He said, okay, just the guys. And just the guys were the guys in Muscle Shoals. The guys. It was David Briggs and those guys. And they still had not hooked up with Neil and the people that they later would. Right. When they became legendary guys from Muscle Shoals. But for me, they were the guys who were just setting down this hellacious backbeat. Yeah, that made, Yeah, and that even made the most flub-a-dub foxtrot start to look like Red and Ginger. I mean, it was just a rocking, locked-down band that you figured, ah, I have wandered into perfection until you heard them play with Aretha. And when Aretha sat down to play, everybody in the place turned into wallpaper. We all just went, because it was, it was astounding. I, it was astounding. It was like nothing you had ever heard. All right. You know, Nez, two, two weeks ago, I had a guest on the show named Dan Penn, who's a fabulous songwriter from Muscle Shoals. Yes. And he, he wrote a number of songs for Aretha at Rick Hall's yeah. place, right? And we talked all about this and this one, I'm glad you brought this up because I like to let people know, especially younger people, that back then, 60s, early 70s, uh, genres of music were much more uh, cross-pollinated. Uh, what we feel so rigid about with what is country and what is rock and roll and what is soul music and what is rhythm and blues it was much more porous at that time, which is why I ask you, how do you feel about being called a pioneer of country rock? Do you see yourself in that way? Uh, no. Uh, first of all, that's titular. It's, it's not, they're just trying to get, whoever's using that is just trying to get their arms around what the hell is this thing. Right. Uh, and that's, that's all fair enough. And because First National Band and that music is marginal, and you really have to come to it with a certain understanding of it already in place, uh, th then it's, people describe it differently. People think of it differently. And it never agrees, the descriptions. It's never like, oh, I see. you know what this is? No, nobody knows what it is. And I still don't. Now, people will come up and say to me, that's country rock. And, mm, good on you. Or that's this and no, I don't know what it is. I have no idea. I did not make it up. I didn't do anything. I just started playing and there it was. So I'll take that any day of the week. 
it doesn't happen off of that. I, I think the music, that, 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 that Magnetic South record is very soulful. I would call it soul music. I call any, any music I like, I call soul music. So yeah, I consider it soul it music. Is. It is yours, so right, sir. So right. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. You're being very generous with your time. And it's just a pleasure to have my good pal, Mike Nesmith from the Monkees, Mike Nesmith from First National Band, Mike Nesmith from 80s video production, film production, which is a, what, my next question. I love the film Repo Man, and I've loved it for years. And it was only recently uh, when I saw that your, your name attached to it as a producer, uh, I wondered how did that come about in what was it like working with Harry Dean Stanton, who's one of my favorite actors of all time? Well, uh, let's, let's take Harry Dean first. Harry Dean was, was a communal friend of uh, Jack and mine. Uh, and Jack introduced me to him, and, and I just fell in love with Harry Dean like I did with Jack. Harry, Harry Dean was um, Harry Zen Stanton, is what I called him, because he was just, uh, you know, on, uh, he was constantly, chanting constantly on a on a set <laughs> constantly being you know that guy and um so when i was working with him on repo man he and alex got into a, a squabble that would be alex cox the director of the film director. yeah and i i got them both aside and i was saying to alex i said alex we're one day away from filming you can't replace this man You've got to use him all the way through all the shoots, all the shots. And we've got to go back in and do pickups, perhaps. So the, get it out of your mind that you're going with an executive fiat directorially, get rid of Harry Dean Stanton. You're not going to do it. I can't let you do it, but you couldn't even if you wanted to. He's locked to this picture like you are. This is your big chance. Don't muck it up. <laughs> so. And they both kind of looked at each other and Alex went, I thought, okay, if that's all I'm getting, that's all I'm getting. But he, to his great credit, he calmed down, finished the next day's shooting and it became Regal Man. And it's a great film. And I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad you intervened to keep Harry Dean in the movie because yeah. it proves my theory that any film or television show with Harry Dean Stanton in it is worth watching. <laughs> okay, yeah. he's just he's just one of those. You had a, you had a series in the '80s that I don't know much about, but I'd like to ask you about uh, the television parts. Uh, I've never seen it. Where can we see the television parts episodes? Are they available anywhere? Well, there's a there's a couple of guys who have uh, put together a retrospective of my work. Which I'm not at liberty to talk about. I just okay. got to back off of it. I don't know why. Anyway, it's um. Well, why am I flagged off of that? Why don't you want me to talk about it? Because I don't know what you're talking about. All television parts is on YouTube. It's on the Video Ranch YouTube channel. Yeah, Video Ranch channel is in YouTube. Um, Fantastic. I, I will encourage my viewers to check it out on YouTube. I was curious if there would be any kind of official release or. Uh... Well, there's not. There's um, um, this, what do we call it? It's a kind of a dictionary movie. Um, talking about tape heads. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm j just trying to find some kind of. So, something less than a square aesthetic. <laughs> well, uh, I wanted to ask you one more thing, my friend. Uh, you, you, you made this incredible record that came out of nowhere. Uh, four years ago, the Monkees did a record called Good Times. Yeah. Now, I don't, I'm going to ask you in a second how you feel about it. But for those of us that are lifelong Monkees fans, I thought it was just a fabulous representation of the Monkees aesthetic. And uh, your song, I Know What I Know, to me is one of the great Monkee songs. Oh, I mean, good on you, pal. God it's bless fabulous. You. Could you tell us a second, for one second, how that song came about and, and what the project was like to work on? Well, I don't think I can 
you know, uh, the origins and genesis and gestation periods of songs is not biological. It's just purely spiritual. And it works according to the laws and time of spirit. Spirit is sidereal. The laws of sidereal time are sidereal. So it's, it's of the stars. It comes to us from the stars. Now, what I do with that is I try to find the place that I fit. I don't try to find a place where I can drive it. Uh, go in there and see if I'm inspired to play something. And if I am inspired to play, is it something I can play? Because I can't play worth a flip. And if I can't exactly play it, one of my kids can. Uh, they're they're uh, very highly qualified genius musicians. <clears throat> and they've come in and they've, they've, they've done stuff over the ages. Uh, what are we talking about? I just got hit with a reset. What? I know what I know. Oh, yes. God, thank you. So I was um, sitting around and I couldn't figure out this chordal passage, which is now the chord changes of I know what I know. And I, I was banging away at it. And I may have been Christian, but I, as, I, as I'm telling you the story, I think maybe it wasn't. Anyway, it was someone who said that you're trying to play a diminished there. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Play the diminished. And if you do, the, the, melody, right, the melody will come to life. And sure enough, it did. So once that happened, I had my melody. And once I had the melody, I had the poetry. It's a fabulous piece of work and uh, extra poignant because one of the producers on the record was Adam Schlesinger uh, from Fountains of Wayne, who we lost this year to COVID-19. This is true. Um, he was really, uh, bes besides uh, a very talented songwriter and producer, he was a huge, uh, I feel like Fountains of Wayne carried a little bit of the monkey's legacy. Yeah, he uh, did too, yeah. In their music. Yeah, so he said, yeah. No, it was fun working with him. I think <clears throat> he was more surprised than not that we could play as well as, well as we played. We were not an ensemble band. We're not gonna sit down and you know, play the click tracks, but we could get it out there like, like the best hooting he had going. And so that's what we were able to do. And he got onto that really quick and started having us do the parts, which became the good times, good times. It's fabulous. Just to, just to bring this whole conversation home, I know that last year you did a fabulous tour with, with Mickey Dolenz, you did the Mike and Mickey show. You went to Australia. No oh boy, um, did we ever. How, how was that for you? you? You hadn't been to Australia in many decades. It was fabulous. Uh, there was a lot of things that was so, uh, uh, get, getting rid of the blob of light. You're good. Kind of, I can't tell. Uh, it, it, you know, the trip down there is arduous for America. So it's 20 hours, and unless you're first class, which is not all that much better than coach. Uh, <clears throat> it's just a nightmare. So a couple of ambient, <laughs> a couple of things, and then you get off the airplane in wherever you land, and you're bye. <laughs> and for the, the next eight hours, that's the way you are. Once you're over there, it's a great place to be. Good restaurants, good people, good hotels, uh, and just you know. Uh, it was fun for me. I had a good they, time. They love the monkeys in oh, Australia, man. that's for sure. Well, that, or so it would appear. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether they really do or not. But well, we listen, guys, you have been so generous with your time. Uh, we're just so happy to have you here on Tub Cookies. I know you've been doing some meet and greets lately with some of your fans, and some of our viewers would like to be part of that. Where can they meet and greet? with the great Mike Nesmith, where can they do, be a part of the meet and greet? Well, uh, on, uh, go to, go to videoranch.com and look for virtual meets and greets or meet and greets on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, you can connect it there. Once you're in there, you can talk to the people, staff and so forth, and they'll set you up with times and times with me and so forth. 
Uh, if you ask if you can have a meet and greet with me, the answer is usually yes. I don't have any reason not to do it. And I have all, all kinds of reasons why it's fun to do. So uh, especially if you've got any good tips for where I can get some um, uh, un, unheralded ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, my pal, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. Same here. Uh, I'm deeply impressed uh, with you, especially after a quintuple bypass surgery, that you look fabulous, you sound fabulous. Yeah. And uh, I just hope we get more music, more wit, more writing from you. And you're always welcome here at Tough Cookies. And I just want to thank you for a lifetime of great work, Mike Nesmith. Thank you, Nez. That was great. I really enjoyed it. I love but talking to you guys, get the word out. And I, <clears throat> I appreciate it because uh, you, you know as well as I do, nobody knows who I am or what records I make. So anything I can get out, good on us. You got it. I'm going to go and put on that, that uh, Cosmic Partners record right now and oh, man. Good for fire you. up a blunt and we'll do a duet. All right. All the way through. All <laughs> okay, right, my partner. pal. See you. Bye. Take care of yourself. Bye. You too, you too. Thanks, that was fantastic. You guys have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Take care. That's just a stream. <laughs>